The words to which I would like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the Epistle to the Romans in chapter 10, verses 18 to 21. Verses 18 to 21 in the 10th chapter of Paul's Epistle to the Romans. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words into the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Esaias is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Now, we come here to the final subsection of this uh, tenth chapter of this epistle to the Romans. We uh, divided it up into these various subsections at the beginning and uh, indicated then, as I've had occasion to do since, that uh, here in these last verses the apostle uh, sums up the whole argument of the entire chapter. And in particular, he uh, sums up and finishes uh, what he's been saying in the immediate previous subsection. So that this is a very important statement. You may remember that uh, we indicated when we began this tenth chapter that we regard it as a kind of uh, excursus, almost a digression, if you like. The uh, main argument of the apostle with respect to the Jews would in a sense be quite complete if we went from the end of chapter 9 to the beginning of chapter 11. But as is his custom, he uh, likes to put a case fully and finally, and so he elaborates it. That's our view of this uh, 10th chapter, that it is really a, an explanation and an exposition of what he had been saying towards the end of the 9th chapter. The main problem, of course, from the beginning of chapter 9 right on until the end of chapter 11 is this peculiar case of the Jews. This astounding fact that our Lord, when he came into the world, came unto his own, and his own received him not. But there were those who did, and those to whom he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's the theme with which the Apostle is dealing. And as we've been seeing in this chapter, uh, he has been bringing out with particular clarity the fact that uh, this whole tragedy is due to the fact that they stumbled at this stumbling stone, namely Christ and justification by faith only. And in their folly they were went about to establish their own righteousness, though they could never actually do so. Well, now then, and so he's been telling us as you remember, that uh, God's way of salvation has always been the same. And it has been this, whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then that has led him to say that God has given absolute proof of this because he has called preachers. God would never have called preachers and sent them forth to preach unless this was his own ordained way of saving men. So he's dealt with that as we've seen in great detail. And then uh, he's raised this question by means of a quotation again from the prophet Isaiah. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Now then, that's the thing which he's finally going to deal with. We've already seen partially the, the answer to that question, but the apostle is now going to take it up in detail. And he does so in this most interesting way. He says, but I say, and you notice he says that twice over, and you'll find again in chapter 11 that he says it again. Now, that is a, a favorite way of conducting an argument by the Apostle Paul. And it is indeed a very good uh, way of uh, arguing always. And it's a very good method for all of us to imply. You put up a rhetorical question and you answer it. It's a very emphatic way of arguing. You put up this query and then you answer it. Or put up a case and deal with it. And it is, as I say, uh, a particularly effective one. In other words, what the apostle, you see, is doing is this. 
having argued out God's way of salvation, he's now going to apply it to this particular case of the Jews. And he will go on in chapter 11 to deal with their whole position in a still more thorough matter, manner. So that in a sense, we are leaving the great realm of doctrine pure and simple, as it were, and are coming now to his application of it all to the case of the Jews. And he does it in this particular way. Now, I don't know whether any of you have been interested in this uh, point as to why uh, the good people who divided up the scriptures into chapters, why they've divided it up as they did. Some may have wondered, why didn't they start a new chapter at the beginning of verse 18? You see, he's finished with his exposition of God's way of salvation through preaching. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's how faith comes. It's the result of hearing, and hearing comes by the preaching, and so on. Well, now, there, you see, in a sense, he's finished the doctrine, as I say. Now he comes to application. You would have thought, therefore, that, he might, that they might very well have decided to start a new chapter here, instead of later at the beginning of what is our chapter 11. But I think uh, they were quite right, perfectly right for this reason that here in these four verses the apostle is primarily dealing with but they have not all obeyed the gospel. He wants to finish that off. He's got to finish off that particular point. And it's only after he has finished that that he then can stand back as it were and say, well now then, let us look at the whole question of the Jew. So he does that in verse 1 of chapter 11 when he says, I say then, has, hath God cast away his people? And on he goes to deal with it in the body of chapter 11. So I believe the division into chapters in this particular case is more than justified. I'm assuming that you all uh, realize that the division into verses and chapters uh, has been done by men. In the original, uh, you don't have this uh, division at all. And let's remember, therefore, that the divisions are not divinely inspired. The, the words and the matter are divinely inspired, but the divisions into verses and chapters are not. And we are as competent to decide where to, where to divide as the, as the people who did it originally. But it, it is a matter of interest to notice how their minds worked and how, I believe here, very rightly, they have realized that the major division comes where they have put it at the beginning of chapter 11. Very well then. Now then, the apostle wants to take up this particular point. And he takes it in this most excellent way. And as we follow him and what he says, we shall see that he really here brings a tremendous, irrefutable indictment against the Jews. He shows that their case is completely indefensible and that their whole conduct with respect to the gospel is entirely inexcusable. The Apostle Paul was a mighty arguer and debater and reasoner, and nowhere does he show the brilliance of his debating powers more than he does at this particular point. But let's remember... His ultimate object is not merely to indict the Jews and to show how terribly wrong they were. Don't forget the first verse. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. That's his object. He's not setting out to win an argument. He's not simply setting out to show that he is right. What he really is concerned to do is to show them how, the, how tragically wrong they are, hoping that if they see it, they will repent and acknowledge it and turn uh, to the Lord. His heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. I emphasize that because you and I should be animated by the same desire. It's not always easy to keep these two things going together. But that is what we are called to do as preachers and as teachers and as anybody who is an apologist for the Christian faith when you're dealing with an individual. You've got to show that he's wrong and that this is the truth and that you are right. But sometimes it's very difficult to do that in love, to speak the truth in love. 
Sometimes, unconsciously, we cross that very delicate line and we become more concerned in proving that we are right even than we are in saving that man's soul. But let's remember that a man who is convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. We mustn't browbeat, and the apostle never does that. The argument is tremendous, but it is still an argument conducted in love and with a desire to show them their wrongness in order that, having their eyes open, they will vacate that position and submit themselves with a willing obedience to the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us then, my friends, be imitators of the great apostle in this matter as in every other matter, and then we shan't go very far wrong. Well, now, then, what's his argument? Well, here's the argument. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. All right. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. That's the question. Now, there's a great uh, discussion going on amongst the commentators. I mean by that, that when you re- not those who are alive only, but those who are uh, now no longer in this world, uh, the commentators argue amongst themselves, as they're very fond of doing, uh, over this question, to whom is he referring here? Some say that he's referring to the Jews only. Others say he's referring to the Gentiles only. Calvin, for instance, doesn't hesitate to say that in verse 18 he is referring to the Gentiles only. And as I say, there are others who say it's the Jews only. Well, uh, my opinion on this matter for what it's worth is this, that I disagree with both parties because I think he's referring to Jews and Gentiles. He's referring to all who have not obeyed the gospel. He's been establishing the point that it's preached to all. Well, then he says, it is clear that some believe and some don't believe. Some obey, some don't obey. Now then, the whole question is, why is it that people don't obey in this way? It's true of any who don't obey the gospel. But if I were pressed to say one more than another, I would say that he is referring essentially to the Jews because the whole chapter is primarily concerned with the case of the Jews. And therefore the position is, they have not all obeyed the gospel. Why is that? Now what the apostle does in these four verses is to answer that particular question. And he puts it, as I say, in this interesting way of putting up a rhetorical question and then dealing with it. Now, the apostle here, I want to try to show you, really says four things. He deals with uh, negative reasons and he deals with positive reasons. Why is it that the majority of the Jews have not believed the gospel? Now then, let's take the negative first. Now, here, under the negative, he has... uh, Two things to say. And uh, he puts them himself as negatives. That's why I'm adopting this classification. So the first thing he says is this. It is not through lack of hearing that they don't believe. Not through lack of hearing. I say, have they not heard? Somebody may say they don't believe because they haven't heard the gospel. You don't condemn a man for not believing something that he hasn't heard. Ah, that may be the explanation, that they haven't heard the gospel. Now, the apostle puts it in the form of a negative, a double negative. It really reads like this. Not that they did not hear. Not that they did not hear. Query. Is it that? And you see, by putting it in his double negative, he's implying a negative answer. Not that they did not hear. Certainly not. Why certainly not? Well, verily their sound went into all the earth and their words into the ends of the world. It cannot be said, says the apostle, that they do not believe the gospel because they haven't heard the gospel. Because the gospel has been preached everywhere. And he puts that in this very interesting way by a quotation which he takes from the 19th Psalm. And you remember, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament 
showeth his handiwork day unto day after his speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Now then, the apostle appropriates that language, and uses it to make the point that the gospel is preached everywhere. Now, what the psalmist was saying was this, that the knowledge of God is universal, because the heavens are universal. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament, and the sun. Wherever there is the heavens, and wherever there is the sun, there is preaching concerning the being of God. That's what the psalmist is saying. Everything declares the being and the glory of God, so that there is no spot in the whole universe that is, isn't having a message, as it were, concerning the being and the glory of God. Now, this is something that is stated quite often in the Scriptures. You remember that the Apostle Paul and Barnabas really said the same thing in preaching to those pagan people in Lystra, those people who were about to worship them. But Paul says in Acts 14, 15, Sirs, why do ye these, thi why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left, him, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Same idea. The whole world is inexcusable in its ignorance of God because God, by rain and sun and fruitful seasons, is giving evidence, he's preaching about himself. And it's very important that you and I should always bear that in mind. And you remember how in the first chapter of this great epistle to the Romans, the apostle has been arguing the same thing, where he says in verse 20, or verse 19 and 20, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, the world is without an excuse for its ignorance of God, because the whole of creation is declaring him, is preaching him, their sound and their words are everywhere. The heavens declare the glory of God, so that they are without excuse. In exactly the same way, says the apostle, these unbelievers are without excuse, because the gospel has been preached everywhere. In the same way, their sound, as it were, uh, went into all the earth, and their words unto the end, ends of the world. Now, that is something that uh, one often does. Uh, often in preaching, one finds oneself doing the very thing the apostle does here. You will often find that what you are trying to say or what you want to say can be best of all said by a quotation from the scripture. Though it isn't uh, perhaps dealing with precisely the point that you are dealing with, the same general statement applies to it. And as there the psalmist was saying, that this knowledge of God the Creator is universal, he's saying here the knowledge of the Gospel is universal. But somebody probably wants to query this and say, can you say like that, that the Gospel of Jesus Christ really has been preached everywhere and universally to all people? Well, let the Apostle Paul answer your question. This is how we find him writing in the first chapter of the epistle to the Colossians, in chapter 6. He is writing to these and thanking God for them, uh, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, which you, whereof you heard before, in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world. 
and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you since the day you heard it, and knew the grace of God in truth. He says there to the Colossians that this uh, truth of the gospel has come to them, as it has indeed in all the world. He repeats that in the 23rd verse of that first chapter of Colossians. He says that uh, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Now then, this is where the pedants get into trouble, isn't it? There's a fancy the apostle saying that the gospel has been preached to every creature which is under heaven. Is it true to say that every single man on earth everywhere has heard the preaching of this gospel or have done so in the time of the Apostle Paul? Well, the answer is, of course, no. What does the Apostle mean then? Well, you see, this is what is called hyperbole, if you like. It's just a way of saying that the gospel has been disseminated generally. It doesn't mean every single individual. It means that the gospel is not uh, uh, something that has been hidden. Oh, let me use the words that the apostle himself used when he was addressing that uh, distinguished company, remember, with uh, King Agrippa and his consort and Festus and his wife. The apostle preaching to them and bringing out the facts said to them, these things were not done in a corner. He means by that that they were known. And here he is just bringing out this fact that no man can say that he hasn't heard this because the gospel is preached everywhere. You remember how our Lord himself in giving his commission uh, to the disciples uh, after his resurrection and immediately before the ascension. He says, tarry ye in Jerusalem until... Uh, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. You shall be, he says to thee. Well now, what he, that's another way of saying the same thing exactly, that the gospel is to be preached everywhere throughout the whole world. And he's simply saying that here in a slightly different manner. You'll find that kind of expression quite commonly in the scriptures. And you mustn't come with your pedantic mind and say, does this mean then that every single individual? Of course it doesn't. The point he's establishing is that the gospel is disseminated in this wide manner. We've already dealt with the case earlier on, a few months back, of those who never actually have heard the gospel at all and their responsibility with respect to it and whether they can be saved or not. We've already dealt with that. Here the apostle is simply saying, that the gospel has been preached widely and generally, and the Jews of all people have no right to say that they haven't heard it, and that they don't believe it for the reason that they haven't heard it. Well, now, the gospel, of course, as the apostle says, had been preached everywhere. Our Lord's prophecy was fulfilled at Pentecost. There were people up in Jerusalem then from most parts of the then known and civilized world, and they had that opportunity, and they went back and it was spread through them, and likewise uh, through other preachers, as I'm going to show you. Well, now, this is a most important statement. The apostle says the Jews can't, uh, can't get out of it by saying that, uh, that they haven't heard. I say, have they not heard? No, the thing's ridiculous, he says. The thing has gone everywhere. The sound has spread uh, throughout, into, went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. Well, now, in what sense is it right for him to say this? How does he rarely prove, then, that the Jews cannot uh, plead uh, ignorance with respect to the general statement of the gospel? Well, this is a, a very profound argument of his, and this, you see, is where he brings it right home to them. And he does it in this way. Let us start with the way in which our Lord himself does it. Take what our Lord says in the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. You see, our Lord rarely had to face the same position. All that argumentation between our Lord and the Pharisees and scribes was virtually what Paul is arguing in this tenth chapter 
of the epistle to the Romans. It's the same argument exactly. Listen to this. John 5, 39. Search the scriptures. Or if you like, the other translation, you do search the scriptures. For in them you think that you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. He says, you are saying that I'm preaching some novelty and that you believe the scriptures. Very well, he says, read your scriptures. And if you read your scriptures properly, you will find that they are the very statements which tell of me. Then listen again, verses 45 to 47. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you. Even Moses in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. You see, they'd heard the gospel through Moses, their own scriptures they were so proud of. They were the very ones that were preaching of him. Moses preached of me. Go to your Moses, then he says, if you don't believe, if you believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my word? Now, this is a tremendous statement which we often tend uh, to lose sight of. I'm hoping before we finish this session uh, to take up this point again and deal with it in a more general manner. But there is enough if we had nothing else. That's exactly the argument of Paul in Romans 10. They have heard it. They've been hearing it from Moses. They've been hearing it from the Scriptures. Or take again, our Lord makes precisely the same point after his resurrection in what we read about his encounter with the two men on the road to Emmaus in the last chapter of Luke's Gospel. After these two men had finished their harangue and all they'd got to say and gave our Lord an opportunity of saying anything, this is what he said to them. O oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now all the scriptures, you see, doesn't mean every single verse in the Old Testament, but it means every part of the Old Testament. Christ is there everywhere in the Old Testament. That's what he's saying. Now it's exactly the same argument, you see. And, of course, we have it later on again in the 24th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke, verse 44. He said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. The Jews have no right to say that they haven't heard. They've been hearing it even through the Old Testament scriptures and the teaching of those scriptures. And there it is, as our Lord says, it's in the books of Moses, it's in the Psalms, it's in the prophets. Isaiah 53 and all uh, similar statements. And then you see the Apostle Paul, in his way, puts exactly this same point in writing to Timothy. In the second epistle, in the third chapter, and verses 15 and 16. Here it is. He is reminding, continue thou, he says, in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child, before his conversion, from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. You can preach the gospel from the Old Testament. They are able to make us wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The Old Testament, that's what he means by the scriptures. And if you and I don't see Christ and his salvation in the Old Testament, it's because we are blind, my friends. There are certain foolish Christian people who seem to think we don't need the Old Testament. What a terrible ignorance that is, and how unscriptural in any case. What a contradiction of the plain teaching of the New Testament. Yes, Christ is there. The salvation is all there. If you've got enlightened eyes, you'll find it there. 
And you'll find it there in most glorious terms, quite frequently. Very well then, uh, Paul is arguing that uh, they mustn't say that they haven't heard it. And they of everybody who rejoiced in the Scriptures. The Scriptures have been preaching this very thing to them that they are now rejecting. Then, of course, when you leave the Old Testament, you come over into the New. You have the phenomenon of John the Baptist. And all the Jews knew about him. John was a veritable phenomenon. This extraordinary man who began to preach there in the wilderness. This strange man who didn't dress like anybody else and didn't eat the same food. Leathern girdle about his loins, lived on locusts and wild honey. And this fiery prophetic preaching. This Elijah, as it were, come to life again, and they crowded out to hear him. He was a phenomenon, and all the Jews knew about him. The thing was noised abroad throughout the whole land of Palestine. And what was he preaching about? And what he said was this, I am not the Christ. There cometh one after me mightier than I, the latchet of whose shoes I am unworthy to unloose. I indeed baptize you with water, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is is in his hand, and he will truly purge his flaw and gather his wheat into the garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. The forerunner, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That was his message. He must increase, I must decrease. There he is, he said, pointing to him. And the Jews said that they hadn't heard trying to defend themselves by saying that they hadn't heard the gospel. And yet John the Baptist alone is enough to silence them and to answer them once and forever. The forerunner points to the Messiah. He preaches the Messiah. They'd heard through John the Baptist, who disclaims that he is the Messiah himself, but points to this other. Well, there it is. You see, the evidence is piling up. And then, of course, our Lord himself. The supreme phenomenon. This young man, this apparent carpenter from Nazareth, who begins to preach at the age of 30, and who impresses the people at once. This man speaketh with authority, and not as the Pharisees and scribes. His understanding, the profundity of his teaching. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, I say unto you, this authority. And this profound depth of knowledge and understanding, his exposition of the law in the Sermon on the Mount, all this. Now the whole of the land of Palestine knew this. It was talked about everywhere and emphasized by the opposition of the Pharisees and scribes. And then his miracles. As he said himself one day, though you believe not my works, my words, believe for the very works sake. Look at the works. He pointed them to the signs. These are preaching. Now, all this historical uh, truth is of such tremendous importance in this matter. It is the final convicting of the Jews of their utter inexcusability. They mustn't say they hadn't heard. They couldn't help hearing. It was impossible for them not to have heard. And then, of course, beyond uh, the teaching of the miracles, his death upon the cross, And still more amazing, his resurrection. They hadn't seen that, but they'd heard about it. This was the preaching of the early disciples. This was the reason why they persecuted these apostles and disciples. Because they preached Jesus and the resurrection. And they saw the change in these men. In other words, you've got this tremendous phenomenon of Pentecost. It was impossible for anybody to be a Jew and not to hear about Pentecost. It was such an astounding phenomenon. The people came crowding together everywhere. Everybody knew about this. Well, what is this? This is preaching concerning him. And as I say, these delegates would come up from various parts of the civilized world to the Feast of Pentecost. They saw it, and they heard the preaching of Peter, and they went back. This is the way in which the whole position of the Jew is entirely demolished. And then after that, You have, of course, the preaching of the apostles themselves and how they traveled abroad like this man, the apostle Paul, crossing oceans, crossing continents, 
going everywhere, and the others the same, preaching, propagating, making this message known. And, of course, secular history even testifies to this, that the report sent by the proconsul back to the emperor in Rome makes note of this. It was a most amazing phenomenon in the world at that time. There was nothing that was more spoken of than this very thing. This is the way in which the apostle therefore establishes that it mustn't be said that they haven't heard because it's gone everywhere. Like the sun preaches, so this message has gone abroad everywhere. And not only the apostles. You have those other preachers, such as Stephen and the various evangelists who were sent on journeys and sent out to preach and to propagate the message. And not only that, the devil even helped because there was a persecution in Jerusalem and the people were all scattered abroad and what we are told about them in Acts 8, 4 is and that, that they went everywhere and preached the word. They made it known. They told people why they were persecuted, why they were having to leave Jerusalem, why they had been evacuated, as it were. And it was all because of this message. Their word literally went everywhere. The message was carried abroad and to all portions of the then known and civilized world. In other words... The apostle is making this point, that the Christian gospel is not some secret message. It's not like those so-called mystery religions that were so common in that ancient world. It wasn't an esoteric message. You know, these mystery religions, they didn't preach their gospel from the housetops. They didn't make it known to everybody. No, no, you had to be initiated. It was a secret message. There are organizations and societies that still do that sort of thing. We don't know what they believe exactly because we haven't been initiated. We don't belong to them. You're not told the message until you go in. It's secret. It isn't propagated to the whole world. Now, the, the apostle's point is that the gospel is the exact opposite of that. Not some hidden, secret, esoteric message. But it is something that at the command of God himself and the Lord Jesus Christ through the called, appointed, sent preachers is to be heard by everybody, everywhere. Very well then, there the apostle, you see, has dealt with what I call his first negative argument. The explanation of the Jews and their rejection is not that they haven't heard. They haven't a leg to stand on on that, on that score. Because the gospel has been spread abroad in this amazing manner. Well then, the second, the second negative, I'm only going to mention it to you tonight because we haven't got time, obviously, to work it out. The second negative is that their trouble was not due to lack of plain teaching concerning the gospel. You see, how the one follows from the other. All right, let's grant that this message has gone abroad. But is the message quite plain and clear about all this? And the apostle says that it is. He puts that again in the form of this negative rhetorical question. I say, uh, did not Israel know them? Didn't Israel know? Again, it is one of these double negatives. Did Israel not fail to know? The answer is no. They are quite inexcusable. What does he mean here? Well, what he's saying here, you see, is this. That the gospel is not an innovation. The apostle and the other apostles were being charged with teaching some new teaching. The Jews, standing as they thought upon their scriptures, said, but look here. You say you believe in the same God and that you haven't turned your back on the God of your fathers and that you're not denying our scriptures. You say that, but your message is a blank denial of them. It's got nothing to do with them. It's absolutely new. It's a new teaching. The apostle says it's not. It's not an innovation which cuts right across everything that the Jews had known in the past. How can he prove this? Well, this is what he sets out to show that in the scriptures, again, of the Old Testament, certain things were made perfectly plain and clear. What are they? One, the way of salvation. Two, 
that the Gentiles were to be included. Three, that the majority of the Jews would reject the gospel. All that has been made perfectly plain in the Old Testament. So that they can't say that they didn't know. It's been put perfectly plainly, clearly, and explicitly to them. Indeed, by their rejection of the gospel, they are fulfilling the scriptures. They are verifying the prophecies of the prophets. It is the scriptures in which the Jews so much delighted that convinced them and convicted them of blindness and of sin. Now then, that is the general statement in connection with this second negative argument. And he's going to put it in terms of Moses and of Isaiah. Why do you think he selects those two? Well, because, as I've already shown you in quotations from Luke 24, it was customary to divide the Old Testament into Moses and the prophets. So you have a quotation from Moses, you have a quotation from the major prophet, which is Isaiah, the first in their book, and the major one, the evangelical prophet. So Moses and the prophets, both of them, condemned them utterly and completely. They had no right to be ignorant. They had no right not to understand. The nature of the way of salvation has been made clear. The calling of the Gentiles has been made clear. The rejection of the Jews has been made clear. Very well. God willing, we'll proceed uh, to work out the argument as the Apostle puts it before us in his quotations next Friday night. Well, now then, there you see, in essence, the negative part of the argument. And having dealt with that, we shall go on uh, to the positive. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our oh God, we again come unto thee, and we come, O oh Lord, with fear and trembling as looking at the folly of others, we know that we are but in the flesh. And we remember the exhortation which comes to us saying, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. O oh God, we see what frail and fallible creatures we are. And we recognize more than ever that we were not only saved originally by thy grace, but that it is by grace we stand. And we know that nothing but thy grace can keep us and hold us and maintain us until we arrive in the glory. We therefore do again, O Lord, ascribe unto thee all praise and honor and glory. Thine they are and thine alone, and we gladly ascribe them unto thee. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us now this night, throughout the remainder of this our short, uncertain, earthly life and pilgrimage, and evermore. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust Audio Library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.